must unite what has been set aside. We are TFR. Truth Frequency Radio. Hello, listeners from America and across the world. Thank you for joining me this evening. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Secrets Revealed here on Truth Frequency Radio. And we were going to be joined by Dr. Joy, my good friend, Dr. Joy Pugh, who is the author of Eden, the Knowledge of um, Good and Evil 666, as well as Antichrist, the Cloned Image of Christ, and the, her recent three-book trilogy, the Beguiled series from Eden to Armageddon. Which, for those of you that are interested in reading her books, uh, she is now authored through Sacred Word Publishing, and we have made all of her books readily available again to the public community. I know uh, that for those of you that do not know that her books have been reprinted, They are selling for astronomical prices on both um, Amazon and other places like Barnes & Nobles or eBay, as are my two books published through Tate, uh, because both of us were authors published through Tate Publishing, which at the time had been the largest Christian bookseller on the earth, and... um, they well, they went belly up a couple of years ago, and since that time, all of the books that were hosted and authored through them from the various, the many authors that were published by, uh, by and through them, the the books are very expensive, um, and so know that I will be also at some point republishing both Sons of God and Skyfall that you know both of these books are selling in excess of a hundred dollars on Amazon and I ask you to please not not pay that um, that we have been had been until about last week um, selling what copies we had remaining and we are now sold out of Skyfall but we do have a few copies of the Sons of God in hardback available, and you can find those at sacredwordpublishing.net, and we're only charging $60 uh, for those, and the hardbacks are of much superior quality and will last uh, a lot longer than the the soft covers um, do, and that all of our hardbacks, in my opinion, are worth the extra $10 um, charged for that particular format but um and most of our books are available except for the 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 smallest those that are like 100 or 200 pages but most of the other books are available in hardback format as well but i thank you all for praying for her for those that don't know um her husband mel did pass away a couple of weeks ago it has been a very trying time for her, and she is still in the process of getting a lot of things settled with regard to the estate. And she was going to try to join us this week, but just could not make it possible. And also know that I just published her her newest book called The Parables of Joy, which speak about her life and her family and also her marriage to her husband, Mel, and the the things that they had gone through. Um, Those of you that don't know, Dr. Joy is from Valdosta, Georgia. She's a little bit south of where I am. I'm here near Athens, Georgia. Um, And so we've been really good friends for a very long time. And both of us have been confirming witness for one another with regard to the garden parable and the beguilement of Eve. And both of us have also written extensively on this topic. In fact, the whole premise of her three book trilogy um, 
from Eden to Armageddon, beguiled, is about the serpent seed and the enmity between these two bloodlines as it plays out from the beginning, which the garden to Armageddon, which is the harvest at the end of days, the separation of the wheat and the tares. And so um, there's very few of us that carry this discernment and that share it and teach it openly. And those of us that do have been largely condemned by uh, the other alternative truth platforms and um, many you know that have also extensive audience um, for whatever reason they've decided to challenge even though you know they won't discuss it as far as going over the passages and debating the issue chapter by chapter and verse by verse uh, rather they choose to just attack us and and you know speak about us and and condemn us but again will not meet uh, to have face-to-face -face debate as um, adults would but it is what it is um, but I want to thank all of you again for praying for her she is doing much better and she will be joining us next Thursday uh, you can find her latest book um, on lulu.com as well as at sacredwordpublishing.net and also for those that are interested in the newest the latest edition of the Eden Knowledge of Good and Evil 666 we will be reprinting that as well she is doing an update on that particular book and then we will be bringing it forth um, but I do appreciate all of you. Thank you. It's good to see you, Gina and Carol and Link and Shane and Laurel uh, and all the rest of you that are in the chat room and not in the immediate school. We always appreciate your, uh, your consideration. And so this evening I was going to do a follow-up on the Gospel of Gamaliel and cover the last portion, but a little bit earlier, I spoke with a friend of mine, and she's doing a study on um, just the spiritual authority and the way that women are treated within the church and how, um, you know, they're not allowed to be teachers or leaders or to even speak up openly about truth or discernment, uh, and that there's a control factor to the whole way that um, the mainstream churchianity is established and set up. And I personally don't, uh, don't, don't feel like, I, I feel like, you know, both men and women have equal status and equal consideration, not only within the Godhead, but also within the human family that we are equal partner in the uh, raising of children and also in the propagation, the proliferation of life, the preservation of it and the continuation of it, and that it takes both the man and the, and the woman to come together as couple in holy matrimony to share in the duties of honoring and learning and uh, taking care of and um, respecting each other to really um, affect the child in a manner where, you know, they grow up with the equal respect and consideration for both male and female, father and mother. And that if we adhere to such a, a platform in life, I think that things would be uh, different with regard to the way that women are considered and treated uh, and that equality does not mean that, um, you know, the, the honor and the equality within both the Godhead and in with regard to human, um, the family and that, you know, any either or 
should be belittled or that one should take on a dominant role, even though that, you know, the, the man as was Christ was made the head of the family and was given the duty because of, in my opinion, as being the protector, um, that also the man was to, you know, do all because of, you know, even Adam, when the sin in the garden, um, it led to that he would wor work the soil to bring forth sustenance to feed his family. And so that capacity to work and the muscles and the masculinity that was given to man to oversee and to protect the family and to work hard to feed and you know preserve it, uh, I do believe absolutely that that is the, the duties of um, a man. And, um, and, and that the woman should also, um, in taking care of the children and raising them, because, you know, they do come from her body and there's nothing like, um, as far as a mother's love for her own child and caring and bearing and bringing it into the world, uh, a man just can't understand that because uh, we, you know, do not have the capacity to conceive and to propagate life in such manner. Um, but that we, you know, again, we both share in, in respect to doing everything that we can to protect the children and create a environment of safety in bringing them forth. But anyways, uh, with regard to the church and to the way that women are treated in the church, I wanted to share a story tonight, at least a portion of it. Uh, the text that I'm going to be reading from is called The Life of... Let me confirm this. It is called The Life of Xanthippe, Polyxena, and Rebecca. And it's about three women that were very much um, a, a major part of what was the establishment of Christianity in Rome. And in Paul's, the great commission that was given to Paul to go unto the Gentiles, being um, basically rejected of the Jews that he was then told to go unto the Gentiles and to bring the knowledge of the truth of Christ as being Savior Messiah unto them and that the Gentiles were grafted in. And that um, most of you don't realize and, and have no understanding as to the importance of women in the early establishment of the church and the role that they played in in helping and assisting the apostles. And so uh, I wanted to focus a little bit on this over the next couple of weeks and to, to show and to elaborate on that a little bit, because this is an aspect of the ecclesia, which is little understood and largely ignored. And because of that, I think that it resulted in, especially with the, the dominance of the Catholic Church over the creation and the establishment of what is the official and authorized church, um, that even the drafting of the official canon, the Council of Nicaea, and the voting in and agreement upon which texts would be officially recognized um, as, you know, being okay for the church membership to be read, uh, that these were largely excluded. And so tonight I'm going to be reading from this text, and then next week sometime or whenever we do and have another opening to cover this topic, that I will be reading from a text called... Um, Paul and Thecla, which she was one of the first 
female, in my mind, she was absolutely equal with regard to uh, the apostleships uh, and the things that were being done and the amount of people that she brought in conversion to Christianity as faith. And that the stories that I will be sharing with you are uh, really incredible. And so if you have questions or if you have a comment that you would like to share with regard to this particular text or, you know, in, in the role of women or anything of that nature, uh, speak it at the end of the various segments or um, share it at the very beginning in the chat room because I will monitor and check at that time, or you can just ask uh, Laurel or Carol to pass it on to me, and they will let me know. But I think that this text will will bless your life. We probably will not be able to get through the entirety of it because it is very extensive, but it will also show you as we go through the extent of the spiritual uh, nature of the Great Commission, which was brought upon the various apostles and how they interacted with one another and they were appointed to um, to deal with and to assist each other in what was their work abroad in a lot of these pagan territories and in these towns and cities and countries and challenged and um you know many did lose their lives in these other parts of the world uh in speaking for and standing for the gospel uh, of christ all right the life of xanthippe when the blessed paul was at rome through the word of the lord it happened that a certain servant of a ruler of spain came to rome with letters of his masters and heard the word of God from Paul, the truly golden and beautiful nightingale. This servant being greatly touched and being unable to remain and be filled with the divine word, because he was hastened by the letters, returned unto Spain in great grief, and being unable to show his desire to anyone, because his master was an idolater, he was always pained at heart and sighing greatly. Now this was always, now this servant was honored and faithful to his masters and as time went past, the servant fell sick and grew lean of flesh, which his master perceiving said to him, what has happened to you that you are thus fallen together in countenance? The servant said, here is a great pain in my heart and I can in no way find rest. His master said to him, and what is the pain that cannot receive healing from my chief physician? The servant said, while I was still in Rome, this pain and its recurring mishap made itself known to me. His master said, and do you not know of any who have fallen into this disease and been healed? The servant said, yes, but where that physician is, I know not, for I left him in Rome. So many as have been attended by that physician and have gone through the water in his hands have received healing immediately. His master said, I ought not to grudge to send you yet again to Rome, if perchance you might obtain healing. And while they spoke thus, behold, his mistress by name Xanthippe, overhearing these words and learning of the teaching of Paul, said, what is the name of that physician and what is the healing toward of such a disease? The servant said to her, the calling upon a new name and anointing with oil and washing with water. By this treatment, I have seen many that had incurable pains receive healings. As he said this, the images of the idols that stood in the house began to be shaken and they fell down, 
And his mistress beckoned to him, saying, Do you see, brother, the images of the idols being shaken, how they cannot endure the power of the word? And his master, by name Probus, arose from his midday sleep with a very gloomy countenance, for the devil had greatly disturbed him, because the knowledge of God had come into his house. And he questioned the servant of everything in order, and the servant, having been seized by sickness by the foreknowledge of God, disclosed to him the life of a man, and Xanthippe was incurable in her soul concerning this teaching. So Probus, too, was grieved for Xanthippe, because from that time she was wasting herself away with waking and abstinence and other austerities. And Xanthippe, going away to her couch and groaning, said, Woe is me, wretched one, lying in darkness, that I have not learned the name of the new teacher, that I might summon his prayer to help me, and what to say I know not. Shall I call upon him by the name of his God? But I cannot say the God that is preached by such a one. Nevertheless, I shall say thus by conjecture. O oh God, giving light in Hades and guiding those in darkness, Lord of free men and kings, and preached by worthy servants in all the world, called upon as a brother by sinful men and quick to hear, to whom not even archangels can send up worthy songs of praise, who has shown to me, humble and unworthy, the ever-living and abiding seed, though my ignorance accepts, uh, ignorance permits me to not receive it, hasten also the things that concern me. Lord, since by your will you have made yourself heard by me, and in your compassion, show me the proclamation of your herald, that I may learn of him what is pleasing to you. Yea, I beseech you, look upon my ignorance, O God, and enlighten me with the light of your countenance, you that never overlooks any of those that call upon you in truth. Probus, her husband, said to her, why do you trouble yourself so much, lady, and turn not at all to sleep? Xanthippe said, I cannot sleep, for there is in me an incurable pain. Probus said to her, And what is your pain or grief, O lady, that I am not sufficient to comfort you? All that you have wished unto this day I have served you in, and now... What is it that you have, and do not tell me? Xanthippe says to him, I beseech you this thing only. My Lord, permit me for a little and for this day only to sleep apart from you. And Probus said to her, Be it as you will, lady, only leave off your groaning. Then, entering into her bedchamber alone, she spoke thus with tears. In what way, my God, I shall act, or what counsels I shall take, I know not. Shall I declare the thought that has come upon me? I fear the madness and disorder of the city. Shall I fly from this impious city? I fear the contrivance of the devil for seizing the sheep. Shall I await the mercy and swiftness of the Lord? Again, I fear the untimely snatching away of life. For the death of sinners has no warning. Shall I depart and flee away to Rome? I fear the length of the journey being unable to go on foot. But while I say these things by conjecture, constrained by my desire, for I cannot speak with surety, may I find pardon with you, my God, and fulfill my desire with excess of right words and think me but worthy to hear your preacher. For it, I say, to see his face, I ask a great thing. Blessed is he that is found in the company of your preachers and is satisfied with their precious countenances. Blessed are they that are yoked under the preaching of your commandments. 
blessed are they that keep your commandments. But where now, Lord, are your mercies to our fathers, that we also may be the successors in love toward you and heirs of faith? But behold now, Lord, I cannot find anyone that his love for you, that communing with him I might even a little refresh my soul. Speed therefore, Lord, to yoke me in desire for you and keep me under the shadow of your wings. For you alone are God, glorified to all eternity. All right, we'll be right back. All right, welcome back, everybody. I'm going to just get back into, let me check the chat room really quick. Um, hello, Steph. Thank you for joining us, sister. And um, It's good to see that many of you have befriended each other and that have now come to be support for one another, especially all of you kind sisters. Um, it really warms my heart to to see you fellowshipping in such way. Um, it's really, really a blessing. And so I'm going to go ahead and get back into this text because I do want to cover as much as I can because uh, as I get into it, it will, the mysteries of it will open up more and more. Blessed are they that keep your commandments, but where now, Lord, are your mercies to our fathers that we also may be their successors in love toward you and heirs of faith? But behold, now, Lord, I cannot find anyone that his love for you, that communing with him, I might even a little refresh my soul. Speed, therefore, Lord, to yoke me in desire for you and keep me under the shadow of your wings, for you alone are God glorified to all eternity. Therefore Xanthippe saying these words and others like them groaned continually all the night and Probus heard her and was greatly distressed. And arising from his couch when the morning came, he went into her and seeing her eyes inflamed with tears, he said, Wherefore, lady, do you thus vex me and will not tell me your pain? Tell it to me that I may do whatever is pleasing to you and distress me not with your troubles, Anthippe. She said to him, Be of good cheer, rather, my lord, and be not vexed, for my troubles shall not harm you. But if I have found favor before you, go forth now to the salutation and allow me to indulge myself in it as I will, for it is not possible for man to take from me the insatiable pain. And listening to her, he went out immediately to receive the salutations of the men of the city, for he was the great man among them and was also known to Nero, the emperor. And sitting down, great grief appeared in his countenance, and being asked the reason of his grief by the chief men of the city, he said to them that he had fallen into many and unfounded charges. And Xanthippe went out into the garden that she might await there, looking closely for certainty of her husband. And she saw the delight of the trees and the various warbling of the birds and said, groaning, O oh, beauty of the world, for that which we hereto thought to come of itself. We know now that all things are beautifully fashioned by the beautiful one. O oh, power and invention of wisdom, for not only has the, he placed in man a thousand tongues, but also in birds he has distinguished various voices, as if from anthems and responses to receive sweet-voiced and heart-stirring hymns from his own works. O oh, delightfulness of the air, declaring the inimitable creator, who shall turn my sorrow into rejoicing? And again she said, God, to whom praise is sung by all, give me peace and comfort. As she said these things, Probus also came up in the street to break his fast. And when he saw her countenance altered by tears, he began to pull out the hairs of his head. But he dared not speak to her then as not to mingle other trouble with her trouble. So he went and fell upon his couch and said, groaning, 
alas, that I had not even the consolation of a child from her, but only acquired grief upon grief. Two years are not yet full since I was wedded to her, and already she meditates divorce. But Xanthippe was always keeping watch through the doors into the streets of the city. And the blessed Paul, the preacher and teacher and illuminator of the world, left Rome and came even unto Spain by the foreknowledge of God. And coming up to the gates of the city, he stood and prayed and crossing himself entered the city. When Xanthippe saw the blessed Paul walking quietly and equally, and adorned with all virtue and understanding. She was greatly delighted in him, and her heart leaped continually. And as possessed with an unexpected joy, she said with herself, Why does my heart beat vehemently at the sight of this man? Why is his walk quiet and equable, as of one who expects to take in his arms one that is pursued? Why is his countenance kindly, as of one that tends the sick, why does he look so lovingly hither and there as one who desires to assist those who are seeking to flee from the mouths of dragons? Who shall tell me that this is one from the flock of preachers? If it were possible for me, I should wish to touch the hem of his garments, that I may behold his kindness and readiness to receive in sweet order for the servant had told me her this also that the hems of his garments had the odor of precious perfumes. Now Probus heard her words and straightway ran out by himself into the street and laying hold of Paul's hand said to him, Man, who you are I know not, but deign to enter into my house Perchance you may be to me a cause of salvation. Paul said to him, It would be well with you, son, after your request. And they went in together to Xanthippe. When Xanthippe therefore saw the great Paul, the intellect eyes of her heart were uncovered, and she read upon his forehead, having, as it were, golden seals, these words, Paul, the preacher of God. Then exulting and rejoicing, she threw herself at his feet, and twisting her hair together, she wiped his feet, saying, Welcome, O man of God, to us humble ones that live as shadows among shadows, for you have looked upon those who were running into Hades as into something beautiful, who addressed the crooked serpent and destroyed as provider and protector, who were running into the dark Hades as to their father, those that were fashioned with a rational nature, but have become like irrational creatures. You have sought me, lowly one, having the sun of righteousness in my heart. Now the poison has stayed. When I have seen your precious face, now he that troubled me is flown away. When your most beautiful counsel has appeared to me, now I shall be considered worthy of repentance. When I have received the seal of the preacher of the Lord, before now I have deemed many happy who met with you, but I say boldly that from this time forth I myself shall be called happy by others because I have touched your hem, because I have received your prayers, because I have enjoyed your sweet and honey teaching. You have not hesitated to come to us, you that fishest the dry land in your course and gatherest the fish that fall in your way into the net of the kingdom of heaven. The great Paul said to her, Arise, daughter, and look not upon me as having been sought out of your ignorance, but my foresight for Christ, the provider of all the world, the searcher out of sinners and the lost, who has not only called to mind those upon earth, but also by his own presence has redeemed those in Hades. He himself has pitied you and sent me hither that he might visit and pity many others together with you. For this mercy and visitation are not of us, but are his injunction. 
and command, even as we also have received mercy and been saved by him. Probus, hearing this, was astonished at their words, for he was altogether ignorant of these things. But Paul by force raised up Xanthippe from his feet, and she running set a new gilded chair for Paul to sit down upon. The great Paul said to her, My daughter Xanthippe, do not thus, for you have not yet accorded to the faith of Christ, but wait a little till the Lord shall set in order what is necessary. Xanthippe said to Paul, do you say this to try me, O preacher of God, or have you any foreknowledge? Paul said, No, daughter, but the devil, who hates the servants of God, sows wickedness in the hearts of his own servants to oppose those that labor for Christ in preaching. For his wickedness has extended to the apostles and even to the Lord himself. Therefore, it is fitting to approach the unbelievers gently and kindly. Xanthippe said to Paul, I beseech you, if you love your servants, make prayer for Probus, and let me see if he that is hated by you can work in him. Let me see if he can even stand against your prayer. And Paul rejoiced exceedingly at the words of her faith and said to her, Believe me, daughter, that by his suggestion and working, I have not passed a single hour without chains and blows. Xanthippe said to him, But you suffer these things by your own free will, since you have not neglected your preaching, even to scourging. But this again I tell you, that your bond shall be the defeat of the prompter, and your humiliation their overthrow. Now the report of his presence ran through the whole city and the country round about. For some of that city, having been at Rome, had seen the signs and wonders that were done by the blessed Paul, and came to see if this was he. Many, therefore, came into the house of Probus, and he began to be annoyed and to say, I will not suffer my house to be made an inn. Xanthippe, knowing that the face of Probus had begun to be estranged, and that he spoke thus, was greatly distressed, saying, Alas! wretched me, that we are not thought fully worthy to keep this man in our house. For if Paul goes hence, the church also will be held elsewhere. Then Xanthippe, considering these matters, put her hand on the foot of Paul, and taking dust, she called Probus to her, and placing her hand on his breast, said, O Lord, my God, who has sought out me, lowly one and ignorant of you, send what is fitting into this heart. And Paul perceived her prayer and made the sign of the cross. And for several days the people entered unhindered, and as many as had sick and vexed by unclean spirit brought them, and all were healed. And Xanthippe said to Paul, Teacher, my heart is greatly consumed because I have not as yet received baptism. And after this, Probus being again moved by the devil, cast Paul out of the house and shut up in Xanthippe in her chamber. Then one of the chief men, Philotheus by name, besought the great Paul to come into his house. But the great Paul was unwilling to do so, saying, Lest Probus trouble your house on my account. Philotheus said to him, Nay, father, I am not at all subject to him, for in no other thing is he greater than me except in rank and that because the parents of Xanthippe are above me. But if Probus come to me, I am above him in riches and in war. Then Paul, the great apostle of the Lord, was persuaded and went into the house of Philotheus, the ex-prefect. All this was done by the evil one that Xanthippe might receive holy baptism with tribulation and be faint-hearted concerning the commandments of Christ. Xanthippe, therefore, with tears, said to her servants, Have you learned where Paul is gone to? They said, Yea, in the house of Philotheus, the ex-prefect. And Xanthippe rejoiced greatly that Philotheus also believed, being able, as she said, 
to persuade Probus also. Then Probus called Xanthippe to supper, and when she consented not, Probus said, Think not that in bed also you will keep away from me. But when he lay down to supper, Xanthippe, bending her knees, prayed to the Lord, saying, Eternal and immortal God that took dust from the ground and did not value it according to the nature of its creation, but called it the son of immortality. You who came from the heart of the Father to the heart of the earth for our sake, on whom the cherubim dare not fix their gaze, and for us was hidden in the womb, that by taking up your abode and a mother you might make good the offense of Eve, you that drank gall and vinegar and was pierced in the side by a spear, that you might heal the wound given by the rib to Adam. For Eve, being his rib, wrought a blow for Adam, and through him for all the world. You that gave a sleep without perception to the serpent, so that he might not know your incarnation, remember also my groaning and tears, and grant fulfillment to my sleep, and bring sleep upon Probus until I shall be deemed worthy of the gift of holy baptism. For I vehemently desire to obtain this to the glory and praise of your holy name. But Probus, while still at supper, commanded the doors of their house to be secured by cruel and wicked soldiers. And having given these orders, he straightway fell asleep upon the couch. Then the servants came and announced this to Xanthippe that he might be awakened. But she said, Put out the lights, my children, and leave him thus, and in the first sleep, taking three hundred pieces of gold. She went to the door, saying with herself, Perchance the porter will be persuaded by the amount of money. But he, being evil and froward, would not be persuaded to do this. And she, losing also, loosening also her girdle, which was set with precious stones and worth two hundred pieces of gold, gave it to him and went out saying, Lord, I win over my own slaves with money that your preacher Paul may not be oppressed by Probus. And Xanthippe went on to the house of Philotheus, the ex-prefect, as to a great and incredible work, running and praising God. As she therefore passed through a certain place, the demons pursued her with fiery torches and lightnings as she turning saw behind her this terrible sight, and being possessed with great fear, said, What has happened to you now, wretched soul? You have been deprived of your desire. You were running to salvation. You were running to baptism. And you have fallen into the serpent and his ministers. And these things, your sins, have prepared for you. Speaking thus, she was even fainting at heart from great despair. But the great Paul, being forewarned by God of the assault of the demons, immediately stood beside her, being also preceded by a beautiful youth. And straightway the vision of the demons disappeared. And Paul said to her, Arise, daughter Xanthippe, and behold the Lord desired by you, by whose flame the heavens are shaken and the deep is dried up, coming to you and pitying and saving you. Behold him that accepts your prayers and straightway gives ear. See him coming in the shape of a man and take courage against the demons. Then she, rising from the ground, said to him, Master, why have you left this, me solitary? Even now make haste to seal me, so that if death come upon me, I may depart to him who is full of compassion and has no arrogance. Therefore the great Paul straightway, taking her hand, went into the house of Philotheus and baptized her in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Then taking bread, also he gave her the Eucharist saying, let this be to you for a remission of sins and for a renewing of your soul. 
then the blessed Xanthippe, receiving the divine grace of holy baptism, returned to her own house, rejoicing and praising the Lord. The porter, seeing her, complained loudly in violent words that her going out might be deemed to have been without his will, if Probus should notice. But he that gave her light along with Paul kept the whole house together with Probus in a deep sleep, and they did not hear his words at all. Then she went running into her bedchamber, saying, What shall I say of you, searcher out of sinners? Who art most present with us in tribulations? You, your goodness, does these things, since for the sake of the man whom you made, you went down even to death. For however much man stir you to anger many times, yet you, Lord, pour out your mercies upon him. O oh, depth of compassion and wealth of mercy, of unmeasurable goodness and incomparable kindness, O oh, treasure of good things and giver of mercy and enricher of all that believe in you. If therefore one who loves you say, Be near me, Lord, you have already anticipated him. If he say, I give you thanks, hear my words before they are spoken. You understand, and as for those that ask of you, you give to each after his asking. Your goodness seeks out those that know you not, and you run to sinners. O oh, cheerful look, filling the ways of sinners with mercy. O oh, excellent watching and exhortation of the ignorant, who shall tell my Lord Paul of the salvation that has now befallen me? that he might come and give words of thanksgiving for me to this protector of the sinners. Come, many, and behold and know the Lord, who hates sin but has mercy on sinners. Come now, O Paul, preacher of God, for with you even now I sit under instruction and give words of thanksgiving for me. For I desire to keep silence, since human reason makes me afraid, lest I have not the grace of eloquence. I desire to keep silence, and am compelled to speak, for someone inflames and sweetens me within. If I say I will shut my mouth, there is someone that murmurs in me. Shall I say a great thing? Is it not that teacher that is in Paul without arrogance filling the heavens, speaking within and waiting without, sitting on the throne with the Father and stretched upon the cross by man? What, therefore, I shall do, I know not. My worthless mind delights me and is not unfolded to the end. You that had your hands fixed with nails and your side pierced with the spear, you star out of Jacob and lion's cubs out of Judah. You rod of Jesse and man and God out of Mary. You invisible God in the bosom of the Father. And that canst not be looked upon by cherubim and art mocked in Israel. Glory be to you who appeared on the earth and was taken by the people. Hung upon the tree and by the report of the wicked falsely said to be stolen, and that has brought us all together. While she was still speaking thus, there appeared a cross on the eastern wall, and straightway there entered through it a beautiful youth, having round about him trembling rays, and under him an extended light on which also he walked, and as he entered within, all the foundations of that house shook and sounded with a great trembling. Xanthippe, seeing him, cried out and fell to the ground as if dead. But he, being pitiful and kind, changing immediately into the shape of Paul, raised her up, saying, Arise, Xanthippe, and fear not, for the servants of God are thus glorified. 
Then Xanthippe arose and gazed upon him, and thinking it to be Paul, said, How are you come in hither, preacher of God, seeing that I have given five hundred pieces of gold to the porter, and that although he is my slave, while you have no money? The Lord said to her, My servant Paul is richer than all wealth, for whatsoever treasure he acquires, here he sends it before him into the kingdom of heaven that departing there he may rest in the unending and eternal rest. This is the treasure, Paul. You and your like. Then Xanthippe, gazing upon him, desirous to say something, saw his face shining as the light, and being greatly amazed and putting both her hands over her face, she threw herself to the ground and said, Hide yourself, Lord from my bodily eyes and enlighten my understanding for I know wow alright we'll be right back for second hour everyone Hi everyone, it's Chris Gio here, founder of Wherever you are, make it, make it TTT T- oh. Truth Frequency Radio. Welcome back, everybody, for second hour. I'm your host, San Garcia. This is Seekers of Build here on Truth Frequency Radio. I want to get back into this particular text um, as I want to try to cover as much of it as possible because uh, the latter portion of it gets really, really uh, miraculous. All right, continuing. Then Xanthippe, gazing upon him, desirous to say something, saw his face shining as the light. And being greatly amazed and putting both her hands over her face, she threw herself to the ground and said, Hide yourself, Lord, from my bodily eyes and enlighten my understanding, for I know now who you are. You are he whose precursor was the cross, the only begotten son of the Father, alone above and only son of the virgin alone below. You are he who was pierced in the hands and who rent the rocks. You are he whom none other can carry except the bosom of the father. And as she spoke thus, the Lord was again hidden from her. And Xanthippe coming to herself said, Woe is me, wretched one, that no one has told me what is the gratitude of slaves towards their master. If Paul, the preacher of the Lord, were here, how could he give praise? But perchance in the face of such favors and gifts, they are silent, possessed only with tears, for it is not possible worthily to praise anyone according to his favor. Saying this, she was seized with great faintness from lack of food for having been strongly possessed with desire for Christ She had forgotten to take nourishment, therefore being greatly exhausted by abstinence and the vision and want of sleep and other austerities, she was unable to rise from the ground and Probus arose from his couch with a very gloomy countenance. For in his sleep he had seen a dream and was greatly troubled concerning it. But the porter seeing him about to issue to the marketplace 
having his countenance thus troubled, was greatly afraid, lest, said he, he know what has happened and will miserably destroy me. Probus, however, having gone forth and signified to those in the market what was fitting for the day and season, speedily returned to, to the house and said to his servants, Call me quickly the wise men Barandus and Nostius. When they were summoned, he said to them, I have seen a very terrible vision, and what appeared in it is difficult for our power to interpret. This, however, do ye disclose to me as being the most excellent of all the world. Expound it to me when I tell it to you. Barnabas says to him, if the vision can be interpreted by our wisdom, we shall explain it to you. But if it be of the faith that is now spoken of, we cannot expound it to you. For it is of another wisdom and understanding. However, let our Lord and Master tell the dream. And let us see if there is any explanation for it. Probus said to Nostius, Wherefore do you answer nothing? Nostius said, I have not heard the dream. And what can I say but whatever it may be? If it is by reason of Paul, tell me now, and you will find it so. Probus said, I thought I was standing in a certain unknown and strange country, and that there sat there an Ethiop king who ruled over all the earth and seemed never to have any successor. There stood beside him multitudes of servants, and all hastened to destruction and had mastery far and wide. And when that Ethiop seemed to have gained his purpose, there arose a raven and standing above him cloaked with a pitiful voice. And straightway there rose from the eastern parts an eagle and seized his kingdom and his power and was made vain. And those standing by him fled to the eagle. Then the king strove against those that fled to the eagle. But the eagle carried it up into heaven, and behold, there came a helper to those that fled to the eagle and left his staff to them. Then they, laying hold of it, were not overcome by the violence of that king. So many as ran to those who had the staff, he washed them in pure water, and they that were washed had power over his kingdom." And by that staff, the enemies of the king were put to flight. Therefore, capable men laying hold of that staff turned to themselves great multitudes. And the king strove against them and had no might at all. But he hindered many from believing in him that sent out the men into the world to bear witness. And for that reason, many were grieved. Nevertheless, the one who did not constrain any like the other, for he himself was ruler of all light. This is then was the end. Then the wise Barnabas said, By the grace of God I shall tell thee the things sent into the world by the Lord. The king whom you saw is the devil, and the multitudes of his Servants are the demons, and the throngs about him are they that worship the gods. Whereas he thought to have no successor, he looked not for the coming of Christ. The raven betokened the weakness of his kingdom, for the raven kept not obedience to the righteous Noah, but loved pitiful things. The eagle that arose and took away his kingdom and carried it up into heaven and that there came a protector of those that fled to the eagle, having a staff. That is the Lord Jesus Christ, who left to them his staff, that is, his precious cross, and that he washed those that fled to him, signifies the invulnerable breastplate of baptism, and therefore they were not overcome. The capable men sent into the world with the cross are the preachers of God, like Paul, who is now with us, against whom that king has no power. This was made known to you because even on those who are hard of belief, God has compassion in some way. See, therefore, whether even you will be able to injure Paul through your desire, for the might and the power that shields him 
has been shown you by the Lord. Therefore, understand what has been said to you by me and serve not that king of darkness. For as you saw, his kingdom vanishes away. So shall all his servants perish with him. Come now, therefore, my Lord, let us go to Paul and receive baptism from him, lest Satan have mastery over us also. Probus said, let us first go to Xanthippe and see whether she still lives. For behold, there are 29 days since she has tasted anything, for I saw her face in the evening, and it was as of one prepared to depart. And as they went into the chamber, they heard her singing, Praise the Lord, you sinners, also, because he accepts your prayers also. Alleluia. Praise the Lord, you that have despaired like me, for many are his mercies. Alleluia. Praise the Lord, you that... Praise him, you ungodly, because for you he was crucified. Alleluia. Praise him, you that strive for salvation of sinners, because God loves you. Alleluia. Praise him, you that rejoice at the calling of sinners, because you are fellow citizens with the saints. Alleluia. As she said these words, and more than these, with tears, that wise men Brandus and Nostius Opening the door, entered and fell at her feet, saying, Pray for us, lowly ones, O servant of Christ, that he may bring us also into your number. But she said to them, Brethren, I am not Paul who remits sins, but neither is he far from you. Therefore fall not before my knees, but go to him who is also more able to benefit you. Then they came running to the house of Philotheus, to Paul and found him teaching a great multitude. And Probus also came to hear Paul, and Xanthippe entered along with him to salute him, and coming near to Paul and bending her knees, she did him reverence. Probus, seeing this marvel, that her so proud spirit had changed to so great humility, for she sat beside the feet of Paul on the ground humbly, and as one of worthlessness. And Probus was greatly grieved, not yet attending to the hearing of the word, but was ever gazing and fixing his attention on Xanthippe. The great Paul was teaching thus, let those that burn in the flesh observe lawful marriage, avoiding fornication, especially that with another's wife. And let those that are united keep to one another Probus heard this teaching with delight and said, O oh, Paul, how excellently and wisely you employ this teaching. Why then has Xanthippe withdrawn from me? And Paul said, My son Probus, that perceive that the works of men shall be tried with fire, and that have always in their mind the inexorableness of death, Cast out all desire that cleaves to the flesh. But woe, when the desire shall judge him that desired, then he shall gnash his teeth to no effect and in vain. For the amendment of repentance is past. Hearing this, Probus went up into his house marveling and tasted nothing that day, but went and lay down upon his bed. In about the third hour of the night, he arose and said, Alas, how wretched was the day in which I was wedded to Xanthippe. Would that I had died and not seen her. Saying this, he arose and said, I shall pray to the God of Paul. Perchance he will do to me also what is fitting, that I may not become a reproach in the world, being rejected by her. And straightway falling upon the ground, he said, O oh God of Paul, if, as I have heard from Xanthippe, you seek after the ignorant and turn back those that are astray, do to me also what is fitting, for you are the king of life and death. As I have heard, 
and have dominion over things in heaven and on earth and under the earth and over all the thoughts and desires of men. And to you alone belongs glory to all eternity. Amen. Then Probus, arising from the ground, fell again upon the couch, and arising early he came to Paul. And finding him baptizing many in the name of the life-giving Trinity, he said, My Lord, Paul, if only I were worthy to receive baptism, behold the hour. Paul said to him, Son, behold, the water is ready for the cleansing of those that come to Christ. Therefore, immediately, taking off his garments, and Paul laying hold of him, he leapt unto the water, saying, Jesus Christ, Son of God, and everlasting God, let all my sins be taken away by this water. And Paul said, we baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. After this, he made him to receive the Eucharist of Christ. And then Xanthippe, being greatly rejoiced, began in the house toward evening together with her husband to give good cheer to all those in the house and to prepare a feast. And when they came after giving orders for the supper to be magnificent, she herself went up to the chamber and behold on the stairs a demon coming in the likeness of one of the actors and standing in a dark corner was desirous to frighten and terrify Xanthippe. But she, thinking it to be the actor that she ordinarily had, said in anger, Many a time have I said to him that I no longer care for toys, and he despises me as being a woman. And straightway seizing in an iron lampstand, she hurled it at his face and crushed all his features. Then the demon cried out, saying, O oh, violence from this destroyer, even women have received power to strike us. But Xanthippe was greatly afraid. After supper, then Probus went forth to hear the word. But Xanthippe, sitting in her bedchamber, was reading the prophets. Her sister Polyxena, lying upon the couch, Xanthippe loved Polyxena exceedingly because she was younger than herself and beautiful in appearance, and Probus also loved her greatly. And as Polyxena lay upon the couch, she saw this dream that a dragon, hideous in appearance, came and signified to her to come to him. And when she did not obey to him, to go to him, he came running and swallowed her. From fear of this, the girl leapt up trembling, and Xanthippe, running to her, said, What has happened to you, dearest, that you have leapt up this suddenly? She, for a long time, was unable to speak, and then coming to herself, she said, Alas, my sister Xanthippe, what danger or tribulation awaits me? I know not, for I saw in my dream that a hideous dragon came and signed to me to go to him, and when I would not go, he came running and swallowed me, beginning at my feet, and while I was terrified at this, there suddenly spoke out of the air in the light of the sun a beautiful youth whom I thought to be the brother of Paul, saying, Verily you have no power who also took me by the hand and straightway drew me out of him, and straightway the dragon disappeared. And behold, his hand straightway the, was full of sweet odor as of balsam or anything else of fragrance. Xanthippe said to her, Truly you must be greatly troubled, my sister, Polyxena. But God has you, dear, seeing that he has shown you strange and marvelous things. Therefore arise quickly in the morning and receive the holy baptism and ask in the baptism to be, be delivered from the snares of the dragon. Xanthippe, having said this to Polyxena and having made a cross of wood, went to Paul, but Polyxena remained alone in the bedchamber, her nurse having gone together with Xanthippe. And about the middle of the night, a certain man powerful in wealth and assistance 
finding the doors open and using magical arts, entered within, desiring to carry away Polyxena. She, discovering this, fled into the mill, but the magicians, led by the demons, found her, and she, not finding any door to escape by, said, Alas, that I am given over to this destroyer. For she had heard that he was at enmity with her suitor, and he did this to assail and vex him, being a man who was a robber and exceedingly cruel. Therefore seizing her, they went out of the city, dragging her to the sea. She looked round this way and that, but there was none to deliver her. And groaning, she said, Alas, my sister Xanthippe, you sent 700 pieces of gold to Rome, and buy books that through them you might prophesy by me. For this an evening you read, I looked to my right hand and beheld, but there was no one that knew me. Flight perished from me, and there is no one that seeks out my soul. While she said these words, those that were dragging her away walked in haste, and coming to the shore, they hired a ship and sailed for Babylonia. For he that carried her off had a brother there, a ruler of a district. But the wind blew against them so that they could not proceed by reason of it. And as they were rowing on the sea, behold, the great apostle of the Lord, Peter, was sailing past in the ship, being urged by a dream to go to Rome. Because when Paul departed for Spain, there had entered into Rome a certain deceiver, a magician, Simon by name, and had broken up the church which Paul had established. And behold, as he journeyed, he heard a voice from heaven saying to him, Peter, tomorrow there will meet you a ship coming from Spain. Arise, therefore, and pray for the soul that is troubled in it. As soon, therefore, as Peter saw the ship, remembering the dream, he said, O oh, Jesus that has care for the troubled, whom the tribulation of those in a strange land moves to compassion, whom the weeping of those in captivity made to come upon the earth, who give us at all time whatsoever we desire, and never turn us away from our request, show now also pity and assistance to the soul that is tossed about in that ship, because you, O oh Lord, pity at all time those in pain. The demons then, perceiving his prayer, said to the magicians, Avoid the course of that ship, for if we meet it with it, we cannot move. But the loving God, taking care for Polyxena, the vessel arrived in Greece. The blessed Philip being there and having come down to the shore by a vision and there accompanied him also great multitudes of those who were being taught by him. And behold, the vessel wherein was Polyxena appeared, terribly tossed about. And the blessed Philip said, Behold, the vessel on account of which we came down here in which there is a soul in trouble when the vessel arrived. And all had disembarked upon the dry land. They lay as half dead because they had been greatly tossed about in the sea. But the apostle Philip pondered, ordered Polyxena to be lifted and taken to the place where he was lodging and the rest to be looked to but he that had carried off Polyxena recovering from the disorder of the sea was desirous to take her again, for Philip, having entrusted Polyxena to one of those that were taught by him, went on his way rejoicing. But he that had her said, She was committed to me by a holy man, and I cannot give her up to you. He, however, giving no heed to him, and finding there a kinsman of his, a nobleman, prepared for war, gathering 8,000 men. Polyxena, knowing this, went forth by night and departed. But he that had charge of Polyxena said, Taking the tunic of Philip, I shall go forth alone to meet them. But as he said this, it was announced to him that the maid was not there. Then he, leaving all thought of the war, 
ran into the bedchamber and not finding the maid threw himself on the ground saying woe is me wretched one that have become an enemy of philip what shall i answer him when he asked the maiden from me his servants came and said to him arise or lord from the ground for the forces have surrounded your house and the maid cannot be found he said leave me thus to die on her account perhaps even by this philip the servant of christ may be fully satisfied since i shall be found despising his command then the servant seeing that he heeded them not took counsel to flee from the enemies but again after a little being moved by the foreknowledge of god they said it is not right for our master to die raising the sign of the cross then raising the precious cross they went forth about 30 men upon the enemy and slew 5000 and the rest fled and they returned with victory to their master praising god and saying what god is so great as our god who has not suffered his servant to be slain by the wicked and coming upon their lord still weeping they said to him arise lord it fits it to be not as we will but as the lord wills however going out of the city and not knowing by what way she should walk found herself in desert places of the hills and sitting down said thus with tears woe is me outcast and captive that i cannot find even a wild beast den to rest in woe is me left desolate that not even hades that no one escapes has devoured me woe is me who at one time showed myself not even to my servants and now display myself to demons woe is me that i am now made manifest to all those by whom i disdain to be seen alas for me that was formerly devoted to idols for this now even the mercy of god has passed me in silence whom then we'll be right back for a final segment All right, welcome everybody back for final segment. Um, I'm reading from the life of Xanthippe and Polyxena and Rebecca. It's a extra biblical text from the anti-Nicene church fathers um, that was deliberated upon, you know, when they were creating the authorized canon. And so this is one of those texts which was largely excluded from you know what was and became authorized and approved of and anyways it's part of the great commission to um the trilogy that i did on you know basically the great commission given unto the apostles to go abroad and teach the uh, the gospel so i'm going to go ahead and get back into this and try to to move through it i appreciate you know those of you that are also moved by this particular story it gets it gets even deep deeper uh, and more profound and emotionally moving so all right continuing Alas for me that was formerly devoted to idols for this now even the mercy of God has passed me in silence. Whom then shall I call upon to help me? The God of Paul, whom I have constantly offended? But who shall help me now? No one sees or heeds or hears my groaning. Verily I shall beseech him that sees the hidden things. For who is more pitiful and compassionate 
than he who always keeps watch over the oppressed. But because my mouth is unclean and defiled, I dare not ask help from him. Would that I were as one of the wild beasts, that I might not know what captivity is. Would that I had been drowned in the sea. Perhaps having received the divine baptism, I should have gone where no one is made captive. What then shall I do, for death delays, and night has come on, and there is no help anywhere? Having said thus, she arose and began to walk onward, and passing through a small defile, she fell into a wood very thick and large, and finding there a hollow in a tree, which was the den of a lioness, she sat down there, for the lioness had gone forth for her food. And sitting down, she said, O oh, wretched beginning, O oh, grievous hour in which I, unhappy one, came into this world. O oh, mother that bore me, why, foreseeing my troubles and wanderings, did you name me Polyxena? Has any other ever fallen into such tribulations and misfortunes? Truly, my sister Xanthippe, did you read concerning me? Unhappy one, saying, I have suffered affliction and been utterly bowed down. These words you uttered with grief while I lay upon the couch, thinking not at all of my sorrows. On this account I have come into the depths of evil and passed the night in deserts like a wild beast. But the beasts live with others of their kind while I am left solitary as not being of one race with mankind. And as she was saying these words and more than these, the morning dawned and the lioness came from her hunting. Polyxena, seeing the wild beast, trembled and said, By the god of Paul, O wild beast, have compassion on me and tear me not until I receive baptism. And the wild beast, fearing the adjuration, immediately went away, and standing afar off, gazed at her. And she said, Behold, the beast has obeyed me. I will also retire from its dwelling. And that set, and immediately she began to journey towards the east. And the beast went before her until she had come out of the wood. And then Polyxena said, what shall I give to you in return, O beast? The god of Paul will repay you this kindness. And the wild beast, hearing her prayer, immediately returned to its place. And then she, descending, found a public road, and standing on it, wept, not knowing whither she should go. And though many went past, she turned to none of them, but said, Perchance the god of Paul will remember me, and whoever shall have pity upon me. As she said this, Andrew, the apostle of the Lord, also came journeying to that place. And as he drew near to Polyxena, he felt in his heart some commotion arising in himself. Standing, therefore, to pray and folding his arms in the shape of the cross, he said, Lord Jesus Christ, partaker of light and knower of things hidden, from whom nothing on earth is hid, do unto me kindness and mercy and make clear to me this commotion of heart, and calm my reason. You that make us peace, always with those that love peace. Then Polyxena ran to him, and Andrew, the apostle of the Lord, said to her, Approach me not, daughter, but tell me who and whence you are. Polyxena said, My lord, I am a stranger here, but I see your face as gracious, and your words as the words of Paul. And I suppose you to be of the same God. Andrew understood that she spoke of the Apostle Paul and said to her, And whence do you know of Paul? She said, From my own country, for I left him in Spain. Andrew said to her, And how do you happen to be here, the country being far distant? She said, Because it was thus appointed for me and came to pass. But I beseech you and fall at your feet. Seal me as Paul seals by the baptism of regeneration, so that even I, lowly one, may be known by our God, for the kind God, seeing my tribulation and distress, sent you to pity me. Andrew, the great apostle of the Lord, said to her, Let us go, daughter, where there is water. 
And when they had gone no long way, they came to a well most transparent and pure. And as the blessed Andrew stood to pray beside the well, behold, a certain maiden named Rebecca of the tribe of Israel, brought as a captive to that country, came to draw water at the well, and seeing the blessed Andrew knew him by his appearance. For Rebecca said, This is the appearance of a prophet, and this is one of the apostles. And bowing down to him, she said, Have mercy on me, servant of the true God, who am captive and sold for the third time, who was once honored by prophets and am now insulted by idolaters. And recall me, lowly one, you that was sent to call back many sinners. Andrew, the apostle of Christ, said, God will care for you also, daughter, as well as for the stranger. Therefore, receive now baptism and be as one people. Therefore, the apostle standing prayed, and behold, the lioness came running and stood gazing upon him. And Andrew, the apostle of the Lord, said, What then does this beast wish? The lioness, opening her mouth, spoke with a human voice. Andrew, apostle of Christ, the prayer of her that stands on your right hand has overtaken me. Therefore, confirm and instruct and admonish them in the right and true faith of Christ, for they greatly desire the name of the Lord. And behold, the wonderful condescension of God, that even an irrational and untamable beast, he has poured out his mercy. The blessed Andrew, weeping, said, What shall I say, or what shall I speak concerning your mercy? O oh God, that thus you at all times cleave to the lowly and take care of those in ignorance, being without arrogance and full of mercy. And Andrew, having completed the prayer, he baptized the maidens in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And then the lioness immediately set off to the mountain. And the apostle Andrew said to the maidens, Be zealous, daughters, to be of good repute before God by living well in a strange land, and separate not from each other. And God, that is always present to those that call upon him, keep you in holiness driving away from you the evil one. And pray also for me, Polyxena said, we will follow you wherever you go. The apostle Andrew said, this was not made known to me by the Lord, daughters. Therefore remain with peace, hoping in the Lord, and he will preserve you to the end. And Andrew went his way, rejoicing and glorifying God, and then said Polyxena, Whither shall we go, sister? Rebecca said, Let us depart whither you will, lest my mistress send and separate us. Polyxena said, Come, let us depart into the mountain to the lioness. Rebecca said, It is indeed better for us to live with wild beasts and perish of hunger than to be compelled by Greeks and idolaters to fall into the filth of marriage. So they began to journey, and behold, by the providence of God, they met a man driving asses who, seeing them, said, You are not of this country, and as I see, you wear not its dress. Command, therefore, of your servant to eat bread and receive one piece of silver that you may remember your servant when you buy bread. And he made haste and took the sacks off his asses and spread them on the ground and made the maidens to sit upon them and said to them, Seeing that the wine which your servant carries is gathered by Greeks, tell me of what faith you are, thus, that thus we may taste of it. Polyxena said, We, brother, taste no wine and are of the god of Paul. The ass driver said, Is this god upon earth? Polyxena said to him, God is everywhere, both in heaven and on earth. The ass driver, being desirous to learn clearly, said, Does this Paul then have the same God that is preached by Philip? Polyxena, learning that he was a Christian, said, Yea, brother, this is the God of all, whom Paul and Philip preach. The ass driver, hearing this, wept 
unceasingly. And Polyxena said, Hast then the providence of God overtaken you, that you weep thus? The ass driver said, If you are desirous to learn wherefore I weep, hear the truth, for one ought not to grudge to tell the things of Christ. I was a disciple of Philip, the apostle of Christ, and seeing how all his thought was towards the poor, I took all that I had and sold it, and taking the price I bought bread and wine and divided them throughout the cities to those that had need. When therefore I had done this for some time, in the neighboring city a certain maimed person cried out, saying, Though it was not himself that spoke, but Satan through his mouth, I desire nothing, I take nothing from you, because you are a Christian. Then the whole city arose against me and sought to take me. But someone, some ran one way and some another while I go through their midst, and no one sees me. And issuing from the city, I gave praise and glory to God, that thus I had been rewarded. And I prayed to my God that I should meet someone who knew his all-holy name, so that relating these things I might obtain relief. For the men of this country will not hear at all concerning Christ, being full of impiety and filled with wickedness. I exhort you, therefore, take also one coin from me, and if it seem good, take rest all upon the asses. Polyxena say, may you obtain mercy from God, brother, but if you will receive a full reward, save us as far as the sea, so that if God wills, we may sail for Spain. The ass driver, as if commanded by the voice of God, eagerly receiving the maidens, went on his way rejoicing in the Lord. And he said to Polyxena, Alter your appearance to that of a man, lest for your beauty's sake someone snatch you away from me. And coming to an inn, they stayed there, and on the morrow they went forward, taking heed to the way. And behold, there came past a certain prefect, journeying to Greece, who, seeing the maid, ordered Polyxena to be carried off on his chariot. Then the ass driver followed, crying and saying, A prefect does violence. To none, why do ye this? Then they beat him and drove him away. And he, going on his way, lamented, saying, Woe is me, wretched and abominable one. Woe is me that thought to do good, but now I have wrought mischief. Woe is me that my trouble and my running were ex unacceptable. Would that I had died before yesterday, that I might not have met with these maidens at all. But why do you trouble me, O oh, wretched soul? Let us go to Philip, the apostle of God. If there is not forgiveness for me, it is better for me to choose death in whatsoever fashion than to live with such evil and bitter conscience. So he went and found Philip, the apostle of Christ, and said to him, O oh, disciple and preacher of Christ, thus and thus it has happened to me and befallen me. Has my soul salvation? Philip, the apostle of Christ, said, be not distressed concerning this, my son. It is impossible for them to be dishonored, seeing that no one ever overcomes God. For this same Polyxena, when she first came from the sea, I entrusted to a certain brother who also was greatly distressed because of her running away secretly from his house. Him also I persuaded not to grieve, for through her tribulation and wandering, many shall know God. The prefect therefore carried Polyxena to the city where he stayed in order to be shut up in a chamber. And one of the soldiers seized Rebecca, but the maid secretly escaping fled into the house of an old woman who receiving the maiden kindly and entreated her well. And sitting down, she wept saying, Alas, my sister Polyxena, wretched one, do not think that anyone was oppressed like myself, but now, I am persuaded and know that all my misfortunes and tribulations do not compare with one day of yours. And most grievous of all, behold, I have been separated from you and am again a captive, but search for me even into the next world, my sister Polyxena. The old woman said to her, What ails you, daughter, that you weep thus bitterly? Rebecca said, Allow me, mother, to be distressed and to lament the great incurable pain of my heart. The old woman, greatly compassionate, her wept 
exceedingly, for the maid had told her all that had happened to her and how through Polyxena she had believed in Christ. So too Polyxena shut up in the chamber said, Woe is me, wretched one, alas, for me, miserable one. Now I know clearly how the devil hates virginity. But, O oh Lord Jesus Christ, God of all, since I dare not beseech you of myself, I bring you to the prayers of your holy preacher, Paul, that you may not suffer my virginity to be destroyed by anyone. And as she was yet praying, the attendant came to lead her to the couch of the prefect. But Polyxena said to them, Brethren, make not haste to anyone's destruction, for this time shall quickly pass away and they that work together with the destroyer shall perish with them. Rather assist strangers that ye be not found strangers to the angels of God. The men, being shamed by these words, went to the prefect and said, The maid from fear is seized with a violent fever. And the prefect said, Let her alone. And behold, the son of the prefect came to Polyxena by night, and she, seeing him, was afraid. But the youth said to her, Fear not, girl. I seek not to be wedded with you as the bridegroom of destruction, for I know from your prayer that you are the bride of the God of heaven. I know this God who is never overcome by anyone, for a certain man of glorious countenance lately in Antioch preached this God, and a certain maid whose name was Thecla, believing him, followed him, and encountered dangers on account of her beauty, of whom I have heard that she was condemned to the wild beast. This is the Paul and Thecla that I'll be reading about next week or the week thereafter. I therefore continually gazed upon the man, and he having observed me said to me, God give heed to you, my son. From that time, therefore, by the grace of Christ, I have not gone into the sacrifice of idols, but sometimes feigning illness and sometimes involving myself in some business. My father said to me, because you have not zeal for the sacrifices of the gods, therefore neither are you in health, not being worthy of the gods. But I rejoiced hearing that I was not worthy of the sacrifices to idols. And by the grace of God, are you come hither as a providence to me? Polyxena said, and what is the name of that man? The youth said, Paul is his name. Polyxena said, he is in my city. The youth said, come then, girl, put on my appearance and go down to the shore and wait me there. I, having taken money, will come quickly. And one of the servants overhearing them told all this to the prefect, who being filled with great anger, condemned them to be cast to the wild beasts. And when they were cast into the arena, a fierce lioness was less loose upon them, which ran and braced the feet of Polyxena and licked the soles of her feet. And then the prefect in all the city, seeing this fearful and wonderful sight, gave praise and glory to the merciful God, saying, Of a truth you are, and he that is named by Polyxena alone is God. For the gods of the heathen are the works of men's hands, unable to save or assist anyone. Let them perish now, both themselves and their makers. And the prefect straightway, taking his son and Polyxena into the palace, heard from them in order and faith and the religion in Christ without a mission. And he and all in the city believed. And there was a great joy and giving of glory to God. And Polyxena said to the prefect, Be of good cheer, my lord, for the man of God will quickly come, who will perfectly teach, exhort, instruct, and enlighten you in the knowledge of Christ. She, however, prepared in all haste to depart into Spain. And as I, Onesimus, was sailing into Spain to Paul, I received from the Lord a revelation saying to me, Onesimus, the vessel in which you now are will land in the parts of Greece, and you will find on the shore of the harbor two maids and one youth. Assist them and take them to Paul. When we reach this place, according to the youth seeking a vessel, when the maids saw us, therefore, they knew that we were of the hope of Christ. And Polyxena running to us said, 
Verily, the man of God cannot be concealed, for the grace and kindliness of his countenance makes him manifest. And when we sought to sail away, the sea was troubled by the providence of God. And there was with us a disciple of Paul by name Lucius, capable in word to teach the city. Therefore, we remained seven days, and God opened to that place a great door of faith, and 20,000 believed, and there was great joy and rejoicing in all that city. And when the season was favorable for us to sell, the prefect again constrained us, and we stayed another seven days until all believed and rejoiced in the Lord. Thus now, by the foreknowledge of Christ, the prefect sent us away with supplies for the voyage, sending us also with his son with us. And when we had sailed 20 days, Polyxena was greatly exhausted, and we touched at a certain island for the sake of rest. And behold, a certain fierce and hardened man coming down to us and seeing Polyxena prepared for battle. But by the brace, grace of Christ, our men defended Polyxena and vanquished them. Although the strangers were more numerous and more powerful, Polyxena, therefore, fearing again to become a captive, threw herself into the sea, but the pilot dragged her out, having suffered no harm. Then we embarked in the vessel and fled, for the places were rough and wooded, and we were afraid to remain. And in twelve days we arrived in Spain by the grace of God. And Paul, seeing us, rejoiced greatly and said, Welcome ye that have been in trouble. And Polyxena, laying hold of his feet, said, it may be that this trouble came upon me because I would have blasphemed you. But now I beseech you and entreat that I may not again be delivered into such troubles and misfortunes. And Paul said, weeping, thus must we be troubled, my daughter, that we may know our defender. Jesus Christ. And while we were giving the letters of the brethren to Paul, one ran and told Xanthippe of the arrival of Polyxena. And she made haste and came to us, and seeing Polyxena was overcome by an unspeakable joy and fell to the ground. But Polyxena, embracing her and caressing her for a long time, brought her back to life. And then Xanthippe said to her, I, my true sister Polyxena, went not forth at all for forty days, praying much for you to the loving God, that your virginity might not be taken away. And Paul, the preacher of God, said to me, Her virginity will not be taken away, and she will come quickly. And Provo said to me, It was a sign to her by God to be thus afflicted. Do you see how many... By many devices God saves, so many. But now, my beloved sister, have to expect you. Now, I shall uh, All right, we were almost at the end, but uh, I hope you can help us. Uh, really well. Night off. Okay.